I'm very glad to be here. I mean, Alejandra and I have been in touch for the last uh, couple of years, right? Yes. So it's been, I was here two years ago. And uh, I really have to say that coming to uh, Colombia and Medellin was, for me, like life-changing from coming from North America. It's fabulous to be here. And we've stayed in touch, and I've been looking at critiquing some of the student projects. You know, the idea when we first came here was to work with uh, young emerging designers like yourself, to engage with them and with the idea of actually commercializing your ideas to create product that was suitable for production and to be distributed worldwide through Umbra. So does everybody know the background of Umbra, our products and so forth, or do you want me to tell you a little bit about that? Should I? Okay, so, so 35 years ago, I was, I'd graduated from graphic design. Who's, is everyone here industrial design? Industrial design? Graphic design? Interior design? No, don't worry. Architecture? No, no, it's product design engineering. The official title. I got to say graphic design is a marvelous background for, for doing anything in life because you, when you learn, what you do what you learn in graphic design is to be able to communicate. So to be able to express your ideas in a very clear, understandable way for people to, to engage with you. So when I, what I learned in graphic design was uh, uh, I could help people different companies come to me and I would help them with their idea of communicating their company to the public. And then I realized that if I was going to do it for other people, maybe I should just do it for myself, for my own products. So the theme today is not going to be just about thinking about your profession in a silo. Do you know what that means? Like a, in a separate separate from the rest of professionals as a separation. You should consider yourself as an advisor, to be trusted, to be integrated with a process, not just to be what I call a service provider. Service providing today is about, if you want to get a logo, you can go on a, uh, a search for logos and you can buy them for what? Ten dollars or something, right? Mm -hmm. When you should be charging like, maybe five thousand. So you can't consider yourself a service provider anymore. You have to consider yourself in a much more holistic way. How you're going to use your talents to be more entrepreneurial in your profession. So that's what I did. I said, okay, I know how to communicate. I know how to create publications. I know how to create advertising. I know how to create packaging. I know how to create a trade show, a booth for a trade show. So why don't I do my own ideas and start to communicate those to the public and sell them? And so I did. And so I met up with a business partner. His name is Les Mandelbaum in Toronto. And the first product was a uh, paper window shade. So one of the ideas about creating product is why are you doing it and how important is it to you? Can you be passionate about your ideas? How is it going to work in the world? So this idea of the window shade was I'd moved into, came from, I'd moved into an apartment and I didn't like the, the window treatments that came with the apartment. I thought they were really boring. So I went into the market and I tried to find something I liked and I couldn't because I wanted something very inexpensive. I wanted it to be well designed. <laughs> right. So I, I couldn't find it. So I decided to design it myself. So I created this uh, window shade. And you'll see some of it in the slides there. Um, and I met up with a business partner. So partnerships and collaboration is part of this whole theme today, too is that it's very difficult, if you're a creative person, to do it alone. Very few artists, very few artists can do it alone. 
you need to work in a team. I think that it's very difficult sometimes when you're an artist, and a lot of us are had the same background. Like you're you're going through the school system, that you know your your teacher asks you to do a project, you're quite alone in doing it. You're not working in a team. You're quite separate, right? But when you look out the window and you look at the business school, or the you know where they're playing sports. You see people playing, you know, soccer, they have a team, they have a captain, they have a coach, they're working as a team, and you're sitting there like, doing your drawings, and the other guys are like, you know, passing the ball, getting instructions, following instructions. So I think art education today and design education can be somewhat difficult for you to adapt to uh, a collaborative idea. So I'm going to emphasize today collaboration because uh, everything we do in Umbra, and now we have more than like 700 people working for us, is a very collaborative idea, right? It's not just one person. It's very collaborative. So, um, so the the idea started with the window shade, and it was very so somewhat successful. But what it did is allowed us to go into the market. And then we started to get a feeling through research in the market what people needed. Okay? Because we, had, we went into uh, this window shade business, and then people came to us and said, you know, why don't you do... Where are we? The salesman used to come to us and say, we have the window shades to sell, but we're going to close the customer, like Tugel going to the customer, we need to sell some more things. Why don't you do more things? They have more categories. Why don't you apply the same design principle to different categories? So for me, being artistic and being ambitious, it was quite easy for me to start developing different ideas. So I developed uh, the thing, uh, graphics for the placemats. Everything was very graphic focused because of my background in graphics. If you look at the, all the original products, they're very graphic. They're f and then as we get into uh, 3D product, it's basically extrusion, right? Just extruding graphics, the very strong graphic forms to our designs. So we started to develop more and more products, and then we realized then that we had an idea that was strong, that was about de delivering product that was you know, affordable, well-designed, innovative, original, right? So since then, we've done thousands of products. The idea for the lecture today is about a new uh, idea that we started called Umber Shift. And I like the idea because um, it started two years ago. So it's a new idea, and it's fresh, right? A fresh idea. And it's going to be relevant to you, I think, because it's using, using, working with a lot of young designers. And uh, so this is a, um, a lecture about a case study about this new line that we launched. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting. Cause, so I call it about creating holistic design and a business strategy. So I want all of us to be thinking not just about our own individual designs, but we want to think about what its place is in the world, okay? Everything about it. And that includes... I'm very concerned with the sustainability of the product, and I think you are too. There's a very strong sustainable um, content to a lot of the projects that I see here. Uh, social, what are the social aspects of it? Political, even how does it integrate into our society? Um, you know, the manufacturing of it, the marketing, is a big idea, okay? So a lot of people say, okay, we're industrial designers, we're gonna create the product. Now turn it over to the, where's Juliana? She's, she's the marketing. <laughs> turn it over to marketing after. But what I think you're gonna see from this lecture is that we're gonna talk about a totally integrated idea. So the marketing is not a separate, as we said before, silo, okay? It's integrated with your idea. So my, my concept of a perfect idea is understanding everything about the social, political, environmental issues that we have to face 
and how we're going to create an idea that's going to meet those needs, right? It's not about coming up with the idea first and then trying to apply it. What we're going to try and do with our designs in this particular case is we're going to reverse engineer. Does everyone understand what that means? Reverse engineer. So we want to know two or three or five years from now where we want to be with this idea we have. And then we're going to engineer our design so we can succeed and get there successfully, right? So this is a luxury because as you can see here, we talked about 35 years of growing, right, with Umbra. And we're selling in a lot of um, big stores around the world, right? We started with these little stores. Little stores, right? So we want to reclaim our design reputation. So this is a statement about not just being a commodity supplier, not just being a big brand. We want to be a design brand that the world will know again. We want to go back to our kind of roots, okay? So I think this is a kind of, this is very important that you have a kind of statement. And I think when you're starting this idea, whether it's your life, your career, what you're, who you're going to partner with, it's very important to have a kind of clear view about what you want to do, okay, in a project. It doesn't matter if it's a small scale project, if we're going to do something even in a one hour session, or if it's going to be a lifetime commitment. So it's very important to write it down, okay? So you don't leave this to the marketing people to start, you know, after you come up with your idea and say, okay, marketing, come up with the words that describe this. You're going to actually write it down. And it's going to be very important to you because you need to, as I said, this is a collaborative idea we're going to do, right? Don't think about just this lecture and this, these products as the only thing that applies here. This is, applies to every single thing that you do. It could be a small, a daily project. It could be uh, something very serious that you want to do as to start up your business, right? Okay, so, so we said we're an extension of Umbra, so a very clear idea, and we want to focus on the design community, so we're going to do a, a kind of design for designers idea. Um, we want to have a, a lot of diversity, diverse points of view, and in order to do that, so we wrote a design brief. Okay, so I know some of you have probably written design briefs before. I think it's very, very important because you're going to create a document. And this also has a very strong graphic tie to it, too, because everything we do when we create our documents is going to be an expression of what the idea is about. So even when we're using our, our notebooks and creating the documentation, because today people are very, very interested too in your idea about the, co about the process. More than ever, right? They don't just care about the product, they care about the process. So even the documentation, your notebooks, your cataloging, your design style of how you think about it, it's an intentional idea. It's not just randomness. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not against chaos or random, okay? But if you want to, this particular approach is a methodology that's going to be holistic in every way. So when we think about design, and also I was quoted in the newspaper today about there's no difference between art and design, I really believe that. I think everything we sh do should be a kind of an artistic expression, right? So it's very important to have a very um, good idea where you're going through a design brief. So we did this because we also want to share. 
right? As I said, with other designers around the world and all the people that are going to produce it and the marketing people. So everybody has a shared understanding of what the idea is because we've created this brief. And it's kind of, I would call it like a design book, really. Okay? We can all start creating our own design books here. If some of you have your particular style of doing things. You know, it can be, I just think the collection itself is somewhat very interesting. It informs the kind of thinking. So the content creation is going to affect your thinking, but how you actually create the, the, the idea or the product, okay? So we have a very interesting, oh, sorry. We have a very interesting, here's uh, Les and I. I don't know if you know Simon and Garfunkel, but that was what we looked like in, um, in the 80s, right? So this was the first project, the, the window shade. So we give the history, the historical background between the company to the people we're going to share the idea with, right? And then, so materials and objects. Um, fully researched. So in other words, um, if some of you have obviously done style boards. You know, style boards are not just about doing the exercise of a style board. It's a very important document, right? Now you can see here even the way we had some brilliant graphic designers working on the process as well, right? You'll see as it develops. So. Even the way we created the style boards is kind of like a design book, right? I think this is a very, very important point. That we're not separating graphics, industrial design, marketing, business strategy. It's all going to roll up together in the idea that we have. Otherwise, I think it's going to be very difficult for you as creative people to get the, the maximum benefit from your education and what you aspire to do professionally. You need to get this holistic idea going. Is everybody getting this idea? Yes. It's a strong idea. Okay? So, they're creating style boards that are very interesting here, right? And so there's silhouettes of different objects here. All right, and who, this is, I, we say here, building a clear picture of product and brand alignment. Okay, so brand, we could spend a long time about brand. Brand is not just about a name and a logo, okay? For me, the brand, I, I just left, I was with our, salesperson in Bogota, I said to her, don't worry about what you're going to write on your order book or how much you're going to sell. Everything you do should be, when you place our product in a store or when we propose a uh, product program for it to go, it's not about the money. It's not about the success of the product. It's about making sure our brand looks professional, that it's enhanced in the stores. We want, it's not about just creating product and then separating yourself from it and then giving it to someone else. We're totally connected to it because the products come and go. I've done thousands of products. Some of them were very good and now they no longer exist. The only thing that still exists is the brand, actually. So your idea, your idea that you come up with is just one of many ideas you're going to have, but what does it mean to your brand? What's your personal brand, in other words? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? And where is it going to go? Where is it going to lead to? Every idea you do should be continuously enhancing your brand for yourself or for your client, right? So they do, a, this requires a lot of research. So in other words, you can't start a project or an idea 
without a lot of research, okay? Where do we want to go? What do we want to do? Who do we want to sell to? Who is our customer? Who do we want to relate to? What is their lifestyle? What are the po politics of it? What are the environmental issues, right? So they're creating a very clear profile, right? Then keywords, okay? So I said the Umbra keywords to you before, original, affordable, innovative, casual, modern. These are our keywords. When we start a meeting, we talk about the keywords pretty well every day because we want everybody to have a shared belief, okay? You cannot have a shared belief if you're ambiguous about what you want to do, right? Yes, Sorry. a question. Yes, do you use different words for each project you do or you no. use the same words for the whole project? Well, this is my life actually. <laughs> <laughs> So I, it's, it's every day. So I'm not going to do anything. I'm never going to do anything that's not original, right? I'm never going to do an unoriginal product, right? If I have a box beside here and I can check it off, I, I like checklists actually. If you create your keywords, so we haven't done any design yet, right? This is the, the interesting thing about this, is that we're just thinking about how we're going to design something. So we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about how we're going to do these things. And then we're going to create a checklist, if you agree. Unless you dis do you disagree? <laughs> if we all agree that this is a good methodology, we're going to do it. We like checklists as well. You do? OK. You need a checklist if you're going to go get even your groceries. You need a checklist. Otherwise, you're going to forget the carrots. <laughs> then you can't make the recipe. Also, buccal. <laughs> OK, so when I do an, a product idea for Umbra, right? If I can't check off every box, it, first of all, I won't do it. And secondly, if I did it, it would probably fail. So this is about creating this methodology for success, right? Are we getting that? So you, now, you can come up with keywords every day for some different ideas if you want. I don't think that, I don't think that's a problem. Now this is a sort of a longer term vision for kind of brand development, right? And the brand for me is my life, it's my brand. But for you guys, I think at, at some point you have a personal brand. Let's say you're a consultant, a design consultant for Tugo. Well, I think you're, when you present yourself to them and you show your work, you can say you're a brand. And if you're a brand, what's the qualities of your brand that I'm interested in as a client? So this should be very clear. Like, for example, the portfolio, we talk about it all the time for getting yourselves jobs. What's the, the graphic, what's the content creation that you've created for your own personal portfolio and how does that express your brand, right? You know, the, the last person I hired at Umbra, a woman came to me and she, uh, she's a graduate from a design school in, in Toronto, Canada. And I looked at her work, and she was, had good work, it was okay work, but she'd actually built, she didn't go to the art store and buy a flip portfolio to show me her work. She actually built her own portfolio. She designed it, she cut it out of leather, she hand stitched it, <clears throat> had a lot of very interesting design details. So most of the meeting was talking about the portfolio she created actually than the design work from school. Because <laughs> I knew when I saw the work, her actual physical work that she did for her portfolio, I was 
totally knocked out by the quality of it. It was an expression of her brand, right? Everything she could, like she had that thoughtfulness, the passion to do it, right? So, oh, I brought the, who can help me out here? Yeah, thank you. So, um, how's everybody getting this so far? Is it going okay? You're getting it? Yes. Believe me, when we started the company, we didn't think like this. It was random chaos. Okay? But things have changed today. You, it's very, very competitive, right? The world is different. The internet has changed the service provider idea, right? Like if you're gonna go looking for a logo for five dollars, how are you gonna make a living when you go to your client? Like you guys are gonna work with startup companies, right? You're gonna be, you're gonna have your friends, young friends, they're gonna have an idea, you're gonna be the design director. And then you're gonna say to them, okay, I want a thousand dollars to develop the logo. And the guy's gonna say, you're crazy, we don't have the budget for that. I'm gonna go crowdsource for five dollars. Well, where does that leave you as a creative person, right? So things have changed a lot. So I want you emerging designers to be start to think about your careers in a more holistic way. And this is the methodology, okay? So for the development of the Umber Shift line, we added some interesting new keywords. So gift, important to know. Do you want to give this as a gift or is it just a functional item that you buy at a grocery store, right? Utility is an interesting word. Living, fresh, leading, contemporary, unique, individual. So we added some more boxes to check off. Okay? Okay, and then, I'm going to blow this up a bit. Then we started to look in the, uh, in the marketplace. So remember, we haven't done any design yet, right? This is just thinking where we want to be, who we want to be, how we're going to do it, right? No design. We haven't put the paper, pencil on the paper yet. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> okay. So then we went out, we looked at this is the company we like, we like, we like this company. We figured when we, we want to sell to the, some of these retailers, they're gonna be, we're going to be right beside this company called Aerior. You've seen some of these animals, I think, haven't you? Those ones that are connected, little wood animals. So we're probably going to be right there beside that company. So we need to know how we align with them. First of all, we don't want to copy them. We want to be original. So we need to know what's out there. If you don't do enough research, some of you I've seen in the last couple of years, they said, I get designs from, from you, and I say, I've seen that somewhere before. Or do we look on Google Images and see if we've done something similar or not? I mean, we need to do a lot of research, right? Like, if you know this in advance, you're not going to send me a wood toy. If we do a design competition together, and I think we should do one again, what do you think? Okay. Yes, of course. Okay, if we do a design competition, and you send me a a gorilla made out of wood, I'm going to say, what? Well, like, what were you thinking? You didn't do your research, right? So we, we researched everything, everything in this market, right? All, all these guys that we liked, and the materials, the look. We didn't want to copy them, but we also want to know who they are, and we want to sit beside them, right? So we want to feel like we're fresh. Remember the keywords? Fresh, unique, utility, right? All right. And more, you know, more and more, more and more, more and more and more. <coughs> non stop research. And you can see Muto is Scandinavian. So we feel we're going to end up kind of with a Scandinavian friend beside us, right? So we don't want to look like Scandinavian. 
right? <laughs> they're, gonna, they're the Scandinavians. <laughs> so a, a lot of research, sorry, I keep forgetting. A lot of research. And by the way, you can see that even the research, this is the design book they're creating when they're doing the research. This is not just about a few snapshots. They're actually creating a design book, right? The graph graphically. It's, it, it elevates the whole idea of what you're doing to create it, make it art. Make your research art, make your, your notes art, make your data collection art, make your product art. If you if think about art uh, on this level, then you're your idea will be artistic. What do you think? Is that possible? So we also collaborated with um, Young. We worked with a Young uh, graphic and branding company called Post Projects. They were in Vancouver. So picking the right partner in this particular case was very important for us because we wanted to get a really fresh look on the graphics. We wanted to work with the outside team. So when you pick, this is very important when you're creating your team, it's going to be very important that you pick the right partners. Like I picked the right partner when I started 35 years ago. We're still business partners, right? So that re applies to personal life too. So we really like the look of these guys, right? And then, so just like the style boards for the product, we also drew from a lot of visual references. You know, we like, we like people that jump in the air. So, uh, we started to create a kind of a lifestyle. But you know, I've seen a lot of lifestyle mood boards, okay, of people jumping in the air and so forth. It's got to be real. It can't be something that you just kind of <laughs> You see a lot of boards like that, right? I know you guys are doing all this, but you got this is a this is a very important document that you're going to share with all your all your partners, right? It's not just about faking, like, you know, having a, a young girl, you know, sitting around with her BMW or something. I see, a lot of st I see a lot of glamour kind of stuff, and then the product has nothing to do with it, right? Like, people seem to like the images of fashion and everything, but then when I look at the product, I say, well, this isn't really fashionable or anything like that, so what does that have to do with the mood board? So the mood board is important because you want to identify, it's not just about collecting images you like. It's about the images you are collecting and really have a very strong relationship to the end product. Okay? So no faking. So more... You can see here that a lot of the images have to do with a kind of studio feeling. So we're looking for... Our designers are going to be... The people we're going to sell to are they're young, they're emerging, they're in studios, you know, they're doing things, they're maker, maker culture. Do you guys know that expression here? Maker? You know, if there's a big, there's a movement now, let's say in North America, for example, for people to start making things again, right? Maybe here too. Yeah, do it yourself. Yeah. So, these are maker culture, right? And then we started to look at art and design as influences, so fine art to, I think it's a very interesting um, influence to not just think about commercial ideas, but to go beyond, you know, how does this actually inform our thinking, this sculptural piece? when we're making a product that's going to be, you know, sold worldwide, you know, commercially, right? So this is an interesting 
way of take, uh, I would say, uplifting your brand idea to look at more fine art influences. Do you like that idea? Also here, you can see now this horizon line here where the ceiling meets the floor. It's going to be something that's going to be a strong photographic style that's going to start to emerge. So they're already starting to think, they haven't even designed the product yet, but we're already starting to think about how we're going to photograph it. Okay? This is a cool idea. You're getting... And then there's the, the creation of the logo. So these guys, I'm going to show you a few developments of it. They like the flexibility of trying to do different ways of using either the initials or the full spelling. Or I really like this one because see part of the brand alignment, the, the brand alignment is that we're going to work collaboratively with these emerging designers like you. So instead of having your name on the product. First of all, Umber always puts a designer name on the product, right? It's really interesting. But everyone even, first of all, Apple doesn't even put the name of the designer on the product. But if your company is enlightened enough to actually put the name of the designer's, the, the designer's name on the product, it will quite often be Umbra designed by Alejandro, for example. Mm -hmm. But in this case here, we actually designed the logo to integrate the designer name with the brand. So this is a true idea about expressing the collaborative method that we're creating this. Does everybody get that? This is deep thinking about your product before you even design it. Okay? And then here's how it relates back to the original logo. And then the designers started thinking about the marketing materials. How we're going to create various posters, the catalog. And then now that we have the design brief, a clear, you guys probably have a clearer understanding about this brand now too, right? From the lecture, you're starting to get a feeling for it, right? So the brief is going to go out to the designers, like all of you are going to get the design brief. So now you're going to have the same shared idea that we have for our, our how we envision the brand to be executed, right? So then we started working with an interesting team, a husband and wife team here from Canada. Paul Loback is from uh, New York. This guy here is a very good looking guy. He's actually a Prada model, runway model, this guy. Very good looking. <laughs> His name's Philippe Malouin. He's, he's from French Quebec, from Canada, and he's living in London. So he's a kind of, everyone loves him, person. So you can see here's the bloggers. The bloggers are writing about him, him, about him and how he's emerging. So we're, we're, we're selecting these designers that are aligned with the idea for the brand and we're convincing them because he's pretty hot right now, right? He, we want him to work for us to start designing, right? So it's got to be, it's got to be the right fit. So he's a hot guy, he's a really good designer. He's got to get the idea, right, from us. So part of the design book is to convince people that you're the right partner to work with, right? Isn't that interesting? You want to attract the right partners, so how are you going to do that? You show up for a meeting and you're disorganized, you don't know exactly what you're talking about, or how are you going to convince someone to, to partner with you? You have to have a clear message, right? And then we looked at a lot of design publications and who the editors, now the editors jobs, right, are to find great talent. That's what they're, they're talent scouts, right? These design books like 
I don't know which one, which one, axis, axis here, axis, axis. Yeah, yeah. So their job, their editor's job, is to go to find all the hottest architects, the hardest designers, and feature their product. That's their job. So when we're looking through the magazines and we see, oh, here's like the coolest designer been featured. This is Wallpaper magazine. You know Wallpaper? Yes. It's pretty popular, right, globally. So these are, this was an article on Canada, and it featured all these Canadian designers. Well, we, we, we hired some of these designers, right, because they did the research for us, right? So that's, we got a, a lot of research in this, right? So here's the, the first stable of designers. And we need more women, though, huh? <coughs> We're, we're going to have, no, it should be a balance. There's, there's quite a good balance of w young men and women in this class. That's good. It's encouraging for me. Okay. Good job. Okay, thank you. Because it's, because, no, in some classes, industrial design is sort of related to maybe engineering, and then there's not that many women in it. I don't know. They're in more on the interior design. You see more interior designers, right? Sure. So this is the group. And also, we invited the designers at the Umber Studio to also be part of the group, because we didn't want to offend them by saying, no, you can't. Yeah, so, so there's a, this, is this is represented by the studio. It's the Umber Studio here in Toronto, Canada. There's a lot of nice, very interesting young men and women. Maybe one of you will be there one day. And it's a fabulous studio, really great studio in Toronto. So branding, we talked a lot about how we're going to develop the catalog. So some of you are doing graphics, of course, you've seen how you develop the, the typography. I mean, this is a thinking on this level about how you're going to do, okay, imagine right now you guys are getting ready you're going to graduate soon, and you have to create your portfolio and so forth. Imagine if you went to the detail of creating your brand book. And now, this is about creating consistency, because we're going to share this document with every packaging uh, person that's going to execute the product. And they're going to follow these guidelines. So imagine if we actually did that for our own work, that we had guidelines for ourselves, but developing our own personal style. I mean, how thoughtful would that be as designers instead of just randomly going through, I like this, I like that. Like, <laughs> like why, why not try a methodology like this? This is going to, it's going to change your thinking. I say it's going to inform your thinking about how you're going to develop your ideas if you start thinking like this. This is, this is about thinking bigger picture because when you ask someone to, work with you to develop something, like um, to work with you as a partner, and they're creating the documentation for your idea or your presentation materials to be able to sell it, they're going to follow these guidelines consistently, no matter where they are, even in the world, right? This is the reason why we do this, right? So even a lot of color studies, it's very important. Um, I really think if you take the time, look, this, is, this, is a, this was very important to us because we are working, it's a global idea, right? We're going to be working with manufacturers around the world to get everything perfect, right? And you're working your, on, with yourself on your little project, and you think, well, I don't really have to care that much about consistency because it's just me. But if you think about this in a bigger picture about yourself, and you actually develop standards for yourself, imagine as you go through it and the standards keep getting better and better, and how you're going to progress as a professional if you follow this kind of methodology. It's going to be incredibly good. Okay? And it's, by the way, it's easier. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a second. Like, 
you don't have to think that much about how to create marketing materials if you have brand standards like this. Right, Juliana? <laughs> because you just, you have a template. Like, they had a template for this, the slideshow. You can see the slideshow here, right? This is our brand standards template for a slide presentation, right? The guys thought of this, or the girls thought of this. So, it's actually easier as you're developing ideas and materials. Okay, everybody here should have like a kind of template for their idea collection and the way to put the ideas down virtually on your computer. Like, create your templates, create your brand standards, and then start plugging in your ideas. And then as you go through your career and you start to develop this brand book, it's going to be marvelous. You're going to keep, first of all, it's, it doesn't have to be stuck on that either. It can start to evolve. You can keep improving it. But you're building on something, right? So, do you remember one of the key words was gifting? So, I keep doing that. So, so the guys actually, uh, and girls there came up with this idea of this package that could be on display. So really beautiful, beautiful package, right? And there's, there's a, this is a sleeve actually that goes over top of the box. I was supposed to bring a sample to show you, but I, don't, I think I forgot it. Yeah. Anyways. So the idea behind this was that we're going to start to manufacture. When we get to the manufacturer, you're going to see that we're going to be in a lot of different countries. And some of the factories are very craft oriented. Like you guys are going to be able to do this, let's say develop an idea, a regional idea in Colombia. It's going to be a very craft based factory probably. And the packaging itself of those factories is usually not that good because they're not experts in packaging. So what we did is said, okay, you can make a white box, can't you? Yes, we can make a white box. So we had to make a white box. And then these sleeves, we sourced at a very professional printer to get high, high quality standards according to all our Pantone numbers. And then we sent the sleeves to various factories around the world. So when everything came back, it was perfect. Because in my experience, you know, if you send a box to India and a box to Thailand and you say one Pantone number, it'll come back completely different, okay? So we controlled the quality of the packaging because we said gifting, the gift idea was really, really important. So this is not like a self-serve sort of item with a clear package. This is a, a giftable idea, right? And here's an example of one of them with a the product. This is actually a shoehorn with a doorstop. So you can use your shoe and then you can actually use it to hold your door back. Okay, so we'll get into the product in a little bit. So the photo style, I talked about that earlier. The, do you guys think I'm crazy about how detailed we are in this? No, it's wonderful. <laughs> no, because we all go, th listen, not, nobody's perfect about this either, right? This is hard to, keep being consistent. You know, I got to tell you one thing. When we, so our salespeople are costing people. We, working our way through this, and we, here's our chair. This is, this is the good looking guy's chair, Philip Malaron. He did, this is the, the hanger chair. It's really something special. Okay. So you can actually, this is, this idea is to um, address the need for small spaces so that when you can hang the chair in the closet, right, and then you bring it out when, when a guest comes. But aside from that, it's also a very artistic piece and, and a kind of homage to the, the hanger, right, the, the simple hanger. But when you see over here, oh, I was starting to tell you a story. So the, the, the person doing the costing, she we're having a slide presentation. It's going like this, everything. We're making an executive presentation. Then all of a sudden, there's this Excel spreadsheet, costing sheet, comes up in the middle of it. I think, what? How did you do that? We have 
the most incredible, we have an art book here. I want everything to look like an art book, not an Excel spreadsheet. Even when you do your costing, like use the typeface, use the grid, right? And make it a beautiful presentation. I don't care if it's just numbers. Like this is the problem that people think there's a devaluation of things because we don't have to do things artistically because it's just simple function or simple or costing. And then the people doing the costing, how do they think about their job? They don't think of it artistically either, right? They think of it as a mechanical job, that this was the most efficient way to do it. It has nothing to do with art. But I say no. I say that if they're going to be part of our team, then they have to have a shared belief with us about the artistic qualities of the thing. And, we're, and we are going to even include the costing in a, in a beautiful way, OK? That's a, that's a very important point. So here you can see we're talking about the this is funny because in the brand standards, to make a point about how we're going to shoot with this floor and ceiling, they just took a broken box and shot it and said, okay, even if you have a box like this, you're still going to shoot it in a certain way. So there you can see. Now this is really important, okay, because I got to tell you, when, as we start to develop the social side, right? We're going to have a lot of Instagram and Facebook and everything else. And people are, you're not going to be allowed to just post anything, right? Every Instagram and every Facebook shot, it's going to be a, a greedy, artistic shot. And we're going to tell, we're telling people here how we want it to be done, right? So... As I said before, we're working with more craft-based factories, not China. So this is, this is Vietnam, um, terracotta, we call it like earthenware. So you can see here that even during the, this is about content creation. So when you're doing your projects, you're going to take some time out. Who's, we're getting lots of photographs of me, right, and the group. No, because, no, because here, I got to tell you, this is the problem, because you're very busy, like I'm busy talking to you, or you're busy taking notes, and then, so the social side sometimes gets forgotten. We don't realize what an opportunity the content creation is, right? So, so you can see here the guys, when they're in Vietnam, they're creating the content for the design book, right? So it's a beautiful... Beautiful shot there. So even in the, while they're in the factories, they're doing the process, right? Process photography. So it'd be very interesting, even in your workshops here, have you took the time to shoot the process? I gotta tell you, this is very, very interesting to people today now. They don't, they love the product, but they also wanna know how was it made? How was it made? Where is it coming from? How did you do it? It's, it all those ideas form, that's part of your brand, right? how you did it, why you did it, right? Content. And it's, it's the social side of what we're doing right now, right? I'm sure you guys are even better at understanding this aspect of it than me, right? You are, right? You're all social. No, you're all social, right? Very. Very social. <laughs> No, I like I like the social side. I think it's fun. What? Uh, in, on those uh, content creations, do you include like uh, other types of media, different than just print media? For example, videos. Like, for example, you just make a seven-minute video on mm -hmm. how you do yeah. the process. Because I saw uh, my experience, uh, I saw like. Uh, uh, people who they do like PVC figurines, PVC yeah. of char uh, character figurines, and they made like a seven video, a seven video, a seven minute video of how they create a, just a character and how they produce it on a, uh, on a, uh, a 3D printer. And that thing is very, like, very interesting because that really sells the product on showing that on those like a different type, not. 
PVC figure. So I was wondering if you mm -hmm. do that thing uh, again, like you do you see in other social media on like mm -hmm. videos on sharing on YouTube or sharing on Vimeo, for example, on, on I just wonder if you do that as well or you just uh, stay on the printing like like only pictures. No, I think it's yes we do. And I think video I think video is even more important than the, than the stills today, as you know, YouTube. So I would encourage a lot of video, more than just, than, I'm glad you brought that up. What's your name? Uh, Sebastian. Sebastian. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, video to me is even more important. It so speaks so well to the viewer, right? Can you talk about the content and oh, no, thanks. getting the bottom of it? Is it going to the street or just the internet or looking for what you'd like to use in your products? Because, for example, in the last slide you showed something from Vietnam and that's like a process they use there. And is it something like you want to use in your products or is it something that's there and maybe can help you somehow? Those are good questions. Um, so, Everyone's very interested in the how it's made. They're interested in the polit political aspects of it. So the fact that we're making in Vietnam versus China is a very important idea, right? And this was very deliberate that we didn't go to China, okay? Because we don't want the brand in this particular case shift to be too China-centric, okay? So by using the video and showing the, the creation, like for example, here is, so this is the, we call the coil stool, and it's, we're going to get into a little bit about the, the product creation and the methodology. So this is Filipino basket weaving. They have a certain way of making the baskets. So Harry Allen, the designer in New York, I call it a mashup. I don't know if they use that word here. Mashup. You know what mashup? You guys use it for music. Mashup is a cool idea, right? So mashed up, mashed up. This is a kind of a, this is like a tractor seat, you know, for when you're doing the gardening the, in the farm, farmer fields, the seat. So Harry took the tractor seat and he combined it with the, Filipino basket weaving, and it's a marvelous stool. Very comfortable because it's the tractor seat, you know. <laughs> but it also has the craft aspect to it, right? This might be an interesting idea to, to develop more regional manufacturing in, in Colombia because there's a lot of craft. But if you look at the craft in the market, like in the craft market, the design is horrible. Well, a lot of it is. I shouldn't say it's horrible. <laughs> all of them. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. Well, look, it's just not relevant. It's not contemporary, okay? It's, it's based on 500 years of history of, of people making things in villages. But for us in the city, it's not a relevant idea anymore. So how do we make craft relevant? Does it, this, is a great, this is a great concept for for you to experiment in regional manufacturing. Not that you have to be stuck there, but I think it's an interesting idea. Do, do you guys interested in that idea? How to make craft? Craft, craft contemporary. contemporary. This, is, this is a good example. But it takes a lot of work. Huh? I mean, we spent, we spent hundreds of hours in the factory because they're, they're usually making baskets, right? So you had to teach them how to integrate the substructure had to be welded, right? And so this all had to be created and it had to be comfortable, right? It's not easy doing a chair. Huh? Chairs are one of the toughest things to design. Yes, but well, you need your microphone. I think it's a very, it's a fun idea and maybe it's a project for us to work on. No, a regional, a regional idea that's contemporary. How to make craft contemporary. Yeah, it's a fun idea. It's a fun idea. How, 
how to do craft a commercial, like how to become not too expensive, so affordable for the people to buy. That's it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> You're asking me how to do it. <laughs> it's not easy, yeah. But I think. So I think that requires before you go into a craft fac, before you go into a craft factory, and start fooling around with ideas. Do a little bit more research on where you want to go with it, how it's going to be sold, like who the market is. Because if it's too expensive, of course, there's no market for it, right? So who's the market? Where are you going to sell it? How are you going to do it? How, what's the collection? What's the brand? I like the brand idea of mashing up contemporary with craft. It's a really interesting brand idea. So it doesn't matter what the product is right now. What we're saying is the brand, if that's what you want to do, the brand is the mashup of craft and contemporary. So that, for me, is very exciting. I like the idea a lot. And it's also, OK, so then you start to check off all the things. You have your own checklist, right? So you're going to have social. Fabulous. You've got a lot of social there, right? People are very concerned about buying too much from China, right? Environmental. You can address those issues. Political, right? I care. I've been carrying these. I've been carrying these cards with me. This is from a professor in uh, in Toronto. These are all the questions that she has about influences in our society today the social issues, the technological issues, the environmental, political, and economic. A lot of factors with a lot of questions. And everyone in the room is being influenced by all these questions here. So I want to study these questions. And when I come up, when I do my design, I want to try to address these issues. And I want to be able to check off these issues so that I have the perfect product. It's not going to be easy, OK? But I want, I want more product to be interactive, right? So that's going to take a little technology, technological leap. I want to stay, when I make something for you, I want to stay in touch with you. I want to be connected to the product for the whole life of it. So that's going to be hard. <laughs> but there might be a way. That's another project. <laughs> so this is interesting, isn't it? OK, so let's keep going. Um, so we even, we even did, this was quite popular. These are, these are mats that we did, door, like for entranceway mats, door mats. But we use, this is a baka, which is a special kind of fiber that they make a natural fiber. But then the designers did this graphic design. And it's very thick and nice. And it's a, it's a really nice piece. So this is another mashup, right, where the designers are actually, people are very interested in this idea, right? And um, I love this idea, too. So this is uh, Paul Loback, the guy from New York. So he wanted to do a lamp. So this is LED, so high-tech diffuser. He, he mashed it up with a traditional pencil cup. So you have your analog tools, you have your digital technology, and you have, this is fun because it has a USB port in the base. So you can charge your, your phone with a lamp. So if I was doing an electronic product today, anything, it would have a USB port in it for charging. Every single thing you see that's electronic should have USB, even in all the walls. There should be USB now. If you were to do an electronic product with a USB, I, I, I'd slap your hand like that. <laughs> I mean, I want to be able to charge everywhere I'm going, right? 
You gotta have USB is universal. It's the only universal idea for, for charging. Everywhere in the world they have USB. Everywhere else there's like three prongs, two prongs, one prong, five prongs. So I like this product a lot. It's fun. Fun idea. I don't know if this, I don't think this video will work. I'm sorry. I'm not linked, I don't think. So addressing uh, Sebastian asked about video. I don't have the video up here, but we can look at it later online. So we did a uh, called First Look. So it's behind the scenes video of how the photographers are shooting, how they did the catalog. So video, yeah, absolutely, video. So, oh. So, yes, yes. You were speaking about this experience you had with this person that had an Excel sheet on your presentation. Yeah, it's yeah. looking quite nice. I was just thinking, what was your, your, your approach on this person, on this um, um, individual that had a different mindset to convince him and to make him or her, I don't know which one was it, to see and understand the real value of this uh, whole yeah. idea of having things being coherent with one another. Yeah. How, how was your approach to this person? Because I think, and this is the core of my question, that for us designers, it's sometimes easier to understand this, but for some other people, which is not so um, bundled with this whole idea of art yeah. and things being beautiful, that's not so easy to get. It's not so easy mm -hmm. to transmit to someone that's not in yeah. this of thought. So you have to turn it around to make, it's our responsibility to be able to deliver the, the idea and also the, to make it easy for them to do it, right? So you're talking about the Steve Jobs approach to his whole company, right? To bring that design, the art to the, to the computer. It's exactly what he did, the graphical interface. The other guys were horrible. <laughs> That's the Windows. The Windows is the Excel, and then when you go to the Apple form, uh, Apple with the graphical treatments, you, you, it's completely transformed. So it's up to us to be able to, because everybody is very busy, right? And they'll just go to the lowest common denominator to get everything done very quickly, easy. So we have to do everything we can to make it as really easy for them, and also, but. It, it does require more passion to stay with it, to be consistent. But I think it can be done if you create the right templates for them, right? But you have to be thinking all the time about every, everything that everyone's going to be connecting with you. Do you like those cards? They're interesting. They're complicated a little bit. Well, she's a real brainy. She's a PhD, you know. It is. It's for, this is supposed to be for... It's a game that we play to help us think about our um, products. Exactly. So this is the development of the catalog. And also, by the way, while you're shooting, you just don't shoot your product. You have to shoot for everything, every need. So this is showing. So you're going to see, but the bloggers, the bloggers are really important for us. Does everyone know what bloggers? Yeah. yeah. So the bloggers are, are going to be our people, our PR. Juliana, the bloggers are like our, our PR agents. Yeah. They're the ones that are, yes. Do you want to comment on it with them in your business? So you can, you can be on the video. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, so when we're shooting, we're shooting not just, we have to think big, big picture about shooting, everything. So we start off with the process, we're going to shoot video, we're going to shoot a lot of alternatives, we're going to shoot in situ, right? So we don't want to do, the, part of this whole idea of thinking more holistically is to actually be more efficient, right? Because you don't want to shoot this for the catalog and then a week later, oh, we need 
no, the press phoned you up, we need shots of the, and you don't have them, right? I know this sounds pretty basic, okay, but this is very important stuff, especially for the bloggers, you need a lot of stuff. So you can see that the line is developing nicely now, there's a the hanger chair, and Paul Lobeck's lamp, and the stool, and um, the website. So, okay, so, so we need, you can't start working, everybody here should have a website, okay? Come on. You can't just start working on your idea and then all of a sudden they say, well, where's your website? It's got to go be concurrent. While you're developing this idea, you need the template for your website being developed. So you need your website. And it should be interesting, I think. I know you're going to use some templates like WordPress and all these other ones that are off the shelf. But try to do things that are interesting. I like the idea. I like the more tablet-focused ones or phone. Like, why do something for the computer? when everyone's going to read it on their phone anyways, right? I'm doing everything on my phone here. Actually, it comes out all jumbled and everything. It's, it's horrible. I might as well make it for the phone to start. Forget about the computer, right? As soon as you meet someone, they're going to look you up on their phone, right? Okay. So this was going on concurrently. Then the material started to develop. Then we started to market this, so these are the, so all the photography is ready for online sales, right? Very important, right? Steve Allen is like a very high-end website from New York, a New York-based store. So they had everything ready, go, go, go. This was a store, this is a store in Los Angeles. So it's very, they're only, they're not chain stores, they're only independent stores, right? And there's only going to be maybe 100 in the worldwide. But that's part of the plan, right? And then we had the good opportunity to have a nice party. So we can have fun too, right? So we created, so you can see the packaging is rolling out on display, right? And then we have... Film, film graphics for the windows like you have here, but we have it ready to roll with the launch. So film, film graphics are really easy to do. We use it all the time for, for window. You can see here the packaging is rolling out nicely. These are different. This is a decanter for water. And then... Uh, we also have about 20 square meters for shop and shop. So shop and shop is you take the idea and you just put it in the department store, right? Ready to go. So you have the display, the graphics, right? the shelving. We, we, we sourced this nice... Um, clothes rack for the chairs, right? So then some of the customers came in and said, okay, I'll take it. They said, what? You'll take what? I'll take the whole thing. They want everything so they can just put it in their store. <laughs> no, but this is so important, right? Because when you're presenting an idea, you don't want to be ambiguous. I, I see designers show me things all the time. And they say, like, what do you think? They say to me, is this good? Is this bad? What do you think? Do you want this part? Do you want that part? They don't have a clear idea what to present me. I want them to come to me and say, this is what I've thought. I am your trusted advisor. How do you say that in Spanish? Yeah, that's it. So you know everything about their business. You've already done all their research. You know everything about Paul. You can go on Facebook and look at me. <laughs> You know everything about me. You know all about my business. You know what my price is. You know who I'm selling to. You know uh, who I work with. You know all the designers. You know all the competitors that I'm selling against. You know everything about it. So when you walk in with your idea, and we're gonna, this is how we're going to run the competition, 
you, when you show me the idea, you know everything about everything there is to know that you could possibly know. Just show me the idea. It's not ambiguous, like, should we do this, should we do that? This is it. Paul, you must buy this idea for me because I know everything about your business and I know this is going to be successful. Well, that's what I want to see, right? And that, doesn't, that goes with every client. And that goes with your professor too, by the way. Okay. When you show the project, you know everything about the project. You know every aspect of it. This is the solution, right? So we did it. So now we have we got these good looking designers, we got good looking product, we got a party going on. So yeah, naturally. So we, now we got parties all over the world. We got Hong Kong. Well, huh? this is good. See, it's rolling out now because we've been thinking about how to do it successfully. Right? Why do you call it homeless? Because the Chinese, you know, they're crazy there. They like that. They like, the, they like to take an English idea and twist it into something really funny. Like homeless is obviously a horrible thing, right? That means you have no home. So they make their, it's a contrarian idea. What's that in Spanish, contrarian? Yeah, contrarian there. One of the stores there is called God, G-O-D, Goods of Desire. But you, when you look at the store, it says God. You say, what? You call yourself God? That's a very ambitious name for your store. Everybody loves it there. It's so crowded. When you go in Hong Kong, you see G-O-D. They got the, they're crowded like crazy. And everything they do is funny like that, like ironic or contrarian, you know? G-O-D. This is in Holland. So you can see how the thing fits together now, you see? It integrates with the packaging. This is Paris. This is uh, Bangkok. This is Manila. This is uh, Taipei. So this is the, the launch when we launched the, the line in New York, the New York gift show. So you can see the 20 square meters, the layout, the signage, the, and so so the idea is that, so the reverse engineering for this is to say, okay, we're not going to do this for the money. We're not doing this for the money. We're doing this for the brand. Maybe the money will come after, okay? You do it for the brand, and we're doing it for the recognition. So two years before that, I said to the guys when we were working with them, I said, we should win the award at the International Contemporary Furniture Fair in New York. That's what we should do. So everything you do should be about winning that award. This is from the editors of like Metropolis magazine and all these very good magazines that are the scouts for the best design in the world, right? So they won the award because of all that work. And that's what they were shooting for. So that's my lecture. And that's so I want you to follow up uh, on taking a look at the uh, follow this because there's some very interesting things going on. Um, and it's not, believe me, this lecture is not about this umber shift product. It's about the method, right? That's why I'm talking to you. It's about your own personal brand. Do you think it made a difference to you? Can you think differently about the way you're going to do things? Yes. Don't forget when you walk out the door. <laughs> Please. Wait, maybe we need some triggers. So, Maybe there's a, a very good trigger that you can give you to yourself so that maybe it's your screensaver. Maybe it's the most incredibly artistic, beautiful thing that you could think of. And every time you pick up your phone, just thinking out loud here, Every time you pick up your phone, it's going to trigger you to think about thinking holistically about something. Or maybe it's a keyword. I think keywords are good for a face paper or for a screensaver. Keywords in Spanish, of course. Maybe you want some keywords. But you should take some time on developing the keywords.
Everybody's going to have their own keywords, right? I think everybody's got a device here, so maybe that's the way of doing it. You know, uh, people, were, people were always con concerned at the office, though, we're using our phones too much, and maybe we should stop using the phones. And blah, blah, blah. I think, yeah, you know what? It's never going to go away now. The phones are here to stay. So maybe we should connect better with people. Like, why don't I give you my keywords by um, every morning when you come to the office? My keywords are going to come up on your phone. Then I can connect with you. So maybe this is a good way of doing it. Do you need, because it's very easy when you get busy in your projects and your life to forget about uh, the personal brand idea. You can go off on tangents, you forget, you don't do your social, you're not doing your process, you're not, your documentation isn't artistic, you haven't done all these things that you could be doing, they, they will make you happy. So, but maybe you have other ideas, maybe, maybe it's a really interesting app, you know. Maybe we could actually design a, a really cool app. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Is there any questions right now? How are we doing for time? Did I, how, how much did I take? No, you can take a break because we have this space until this place until yeah. How long did we, when did we start? How long was the lecture? One hour. One hour and a half. Fifteen minutes. And how long? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen? One hour and fifteen minutes. One hour and fifteen. One hour and fifteen. Is that okay? <laughs> no, because most people start falling asleep after. <laughs> No, but if you don't have a coffee, or maybe in the afternoon, because they stayed up too late the night before. Okay. No, no, well, if you want to have any questions or anything, does, anybody, any, does it trigger some ideas in your head? Yes, we have some. I have. <laughs> but I don't, but I hate when people are smarter than me. Because <laughs> they. <laughs> okay, go. 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 Okay. <laughs> you talk a lot about methodology. Yeah. And obviously, as a teacher, I'm always concerned about that, about how to teach my students how to do the correct way to design the product, and especially at the end, to be aligned with the brand, as we did in the two or three uh, workshops previously. Uh, now that I'm searching a little bit more about brand and how to translate brand into product design features, I found out two tools or methodologies, I don't know, of doing it. The visual brand language, VBL, yeah. which is like a pyramid, like this. Wow. And uh, something else called perceptual map. So I was wondering if you as a company, now that you have all those rules, do you also use these two, or you don't? Visual brand language. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think. <laughs> you don't have to answer. <laughs> OK. That's my study right now. I think, the, I think the, <laughs> there, there is a luxury when you're in school to be able to, be, to explore more of the academia mm -hmm. and, and, and spend time on the method, like the theory of what you're doing. And I think when you know, you, you study it and you do it over and over again in school, it becomes part of your way of thinking so that you don't have to refer to your textbook when you're making a decision in life after a professional decision or personal. You know it because you've been... Doing it. Several. Yeah, so it's very important to be um, following different... There's different... These are all different triggers, right? To be able to help you remember this idea so you... And that's what school, that's what teaching is about. The methodology is to get you to do it repetitively mm -hmm. and to have some kind of, this is a visual reference so that I think you can remember the idea better rather than just having some text. So you have it supported graphically here too. So this is all very good learning stuff. And, and I don't think we, we don't really spend the time to, I got to tell you, it's very difficult to just not let the Excel spreadsheets get into all this stuff, okay? That's a very tough thing, so, because everyone's so busy, and you'll find once you go into a team or you're working for a corporation or a studio, once the project hits and they have a deadline, everyone's so busy, they're not going to spend the time 
to talk about the theoretical aspects of how we're going to go forward with it or even to spend the time like we did. This was a luxury to be able to say, you know, because Umbra has such a good base, thanks to people like Tugo, they keep our business going so well. We have such a great relationship that we're able to have the financial sustainability to be able to say, okay, team shift, try to do this project for two years and don't worry about the money. Like, don't make us bankrupt. But, <laughs> but here's a budget, and it's, our idea in the end is to win the Editor's Award and to be a great brand worldwide, okay? That's the objective, and you saw that we did it. So that's a great luxury. So most businesses you go to, it's gonna be very, very difficult to be able to stand back and to make these, to do these things. Now, I just talked to the woman that did the, um, the, cards. the cards. She worked for Nokia, the phones. So they used to do something called uh, the word in uh, English is fortify. Fortify. That means strengthen. Fortify. F O F. Is it in Spanish? Fortify. Fortificar. Fortificar. To make it stronger. strong. But also, but the literal translation is four to five, which is four p.m. to five p.m. So it's kind of like a a English pun. So fortify, four to five was fortify. So they would all get together once a week, four to five, and have like different talking like this about different ideas. So to keep design, so not just design, but keep education in the company going. That's a problem that you have to carve out in a business. I got to tell you, once a business is really busy, you go to the president and you say, like, I want to take an hour of everyone's time. Like, what? <laughs> We're behind the schedule. <laughs> How can we take an hour? But I got to tell you, if you take the hour, you probably will have a more efficient company that won't be behind schedule, right? So this is the kind of thing that we all have to work at. It's a very hard thing to do, even in your personal life, to carve out the time to be able to think, to go to yoga, to breathe, to do things. <laughs> no, to exercise. I mean... You know, you're busy, 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 busy. So how do you take the time out to have a little more thoughtfulness? This is an important idea, right? Research. Research for you guys should be a continuous process. Like every time you see something, you should be clipping it, you should be cutting it, you should be photographing it. But then, like, what do you do with it? You need to put it in a, in a folder and design your folder so it's part of your design book. Yeah. Just take a little time to create a, a, a format for yourself. And then the content can flow in so you can have your own design book happening. You know, my, my wife was in J. Walter Thompson as a big advertising agency, JWT. They probably are in Columbia too. She was a creative director there for many, many years. And her, she continuously, she didn't have the cell phones and the... <coughs> In the internet to do the research so she clipped magazines continuously she has volumes and she always used the same she followed the methodology she had a certain kind of book like a large format white page book mm -hmm. filled with clips of everything that she ever loved <laughs> and then whenever she had a project or she was thinking about starting something she just start flipping through this everything she loved book and start getting ideas and mashing up. Do you want to make your life easy? Do you want to make your life easy? Make sure you keep content, keep collecting the research of things that you love. And I really think, I do believe in that. It should be things that really you, that make you feel kind of a joy when you look at it, right? The research. So that keeps the passion going in your, in your work. Yes. You, you're talking about how it's important to define your own style and to know it and know your standards and know what defines you as a designer. What are the first steps to getting there? Because I think it's very hard to define yourself in words and images and, and all of those things. The first steps. Well, we already took the first steps. Yeah. We're all here, <laughs> right? So we already took the first steps. Everybody here is in the, on the same stage, you know? The world needs creative people. 
and they need creative ideas. And they're going to trade with us. Like people that are not creative, let's say they're very operational or very, I don't know, not as creative as us. <laughs> they're going to pay you. They're going to pay you. They're going to trade their expertise, the money they make in their own particular expertise for your creativity. So this is a great opportunity for us. And, you know, this is a beautifully well thought out space here. You know, that uh, even the, the design of the fixtures, the floor, the <coughs> projectors, the landscape. I mean, I think this is quite nice, but once you go outside here, it's quite chaotic and horrible. <laughs> so they need, the world needs us. The world needs us. So this is probably, you've taken a lot of first steps, I think, already along your life. For some reason, I don't know why uh, some of us have this kind of, journey to go on that's definitely a much more about self-expression than actually, um, you know, what we want to call it management or other things. <laughs> My bicycle's ready. <laughs> In Toronto. <laughs> well, it's okay. <laughs> Anyways. So, I don't know how that happens, I mean... He's phoning back again. So, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you could comment on that. I don't know, like I just think when you're, even as a young child, you start to have these urgings to be more expressive and, and we end up here. This is a great place. I mean, some of you, I should say too that in your own careers, you know, not all of us are going to be great designers, but we all certainly love design. We like the idea of creating beauty out of things. And some of you are going to be, actually might find that you're may, maybe you're better, you're better organized, you're better managers. Maybe you love design, but you're also going to be a great design manager. Like you're going to work with designers, you're going to be able to talk. You study design, so you're going to be able to talk to a designer about their project. You're going to be able to interpret it. You're going to be able to talk to a manufacturer about how to develop it at the right cost. You're going to be, there's all kinds of people working at, in the Umber organization that are actually graduated from design school, but they're also, but they're design managers now. So I think this is something that's missing in out of our design education too, that we should spend more time on design management and to be able to discuss the business side of design. And um, so I actually developed a design management course with uh, school, schools in Toronto. I'm a, 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 an advisor to um, the design schools. So, um, but we're, I definitely, I don't know how it happens that there's something about our personalities, I think. You know, sometimes I talk to a group of people and I like to talk about our per shared personalities because there's a certain kind of personality that becomes a designer. So they're all in the room together. Maybe some of us are a little bit more outspoken or a little bit more, I was always a shy person, believe me. I never actually ever talked to anybody. <laughs> That's hard to believe. I know, everybody always says that, but I was very, very shy. <laughs> and so I, so, I mean, some of you are, are probably feeling the way I did when I first graduated, but then I think after you get a lot of experience, you start working with people, and then you have certain things informing the way you think about things. It starts to change your, your outlook on things, so you take more risk. I mean, it's a risk to put yourself out here in front of every, all of you. Right? Because you could be ridiculed, you might fail, you might look stupid, I don't know, all the things that you might think are, would be, make you afraid of public speaking. So you try to, you get the confidence from your experience. So, um, oh, <coughs> the host, huh? Yes. You're going to be on... And I didn't answer it. She says, 
<laughs> Not completely. Um, she says, how is it possible that you define that style because it's hard to have that so clear? Huh. From the brands that I, that I have contact with, Umbra is, you can say it's 100% Umbra. It's yeah. very clear, it's very um, original, very coherente, uh, current. Um, it's like a very simple but clear brand that when you get it, you, it's very easy to work with it. And I think that maybe it's because from the from the from the state the first stage where the designer is I don't know it's designing this glass he has it so clear what is it for uh, who is it gonna be sell to uh, how I want it to be branded uh, how I want it to be advertised uh, the packaging is something that they develop to that the process is much easier than other brands that. Are the products are functional and are cute, but it's not, it's not so current. current. So it's a current? Coherent. Coherent, okay. When you started Umbra, when the, in the first stage, when, peop, when these designers uh, presented the product and said, here, Paul, here is my br brilliant project. Uh, I know it's going to sell $1,000 million. Everybody wants to want, have it, will want to have it. Um, how was it easy to identify if it, if it was an Umbra product, like a, a link with the brand, or, uh, or, or did you have to say many times that no, that product is functional, it must be a, a selling product, but it's not Umbra. It doesn't go with my uh, ADN or, or with my, with my uh, yeah. Um, so please tell us a little bit okay. about it because I think that now in this stage it's, it's easy because you already have a big pro big portfolio and it had and you have a, right. a very const uh, constructed brand. But at the at the first stage, how the, that it worked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so first of all, I think the question started over here, really, about how we get the first steps going, about what our personal brand is or how we're going to express it. So, <clears throat> for me, when I was your age, for example, it was a generational shift from the way my parents lived and the way I wanted to live. My parents had like the Louis the Fourteenth furniture, <laughs> you know. And like very, I call it Barroco. Barroco. Yeah, Barroco. So, you know, I hated it. So then I started to look, you know, so what am I, 15, 16? I'm thinking, oh, I, I started looking at the rest of the world. I said, oh my God, Europe, wow. What? They actually have designs like that there? From Italy? It's so simple and beautiful. And then Ikea, I looked at Ikea, and there was a fair few small stores in Toronto that had Scandinavian design. I thought, oh my God, people really live like this? <laughs> so this was the generational shift. So we actually have now, you have a generational shift now happening too. So you are going to be the one that's going to be able to express the way you want to live. You know, you live differently now than I did. So we, that's why we hire a lot of young people, because we want their new ideas to be able to take us to the next, through the next generation, because we don't want to be just doing things for the way we, Les and I did when we were in our 20s. We want the, the young people today that are going to, and it's a marvelous thing at your age, too, how prolific and how creative and interesting you can, guys can come up with. And it's so experimental and so interesting and so some things that I would just be horrified to see because it's a generational shift because you are expressing the way you would like to live and um, so that's what that answers more your question fully I think that we're depending on you and you are depending on yourself to be like a conduit for your popular culture you are everything that you are because of what has happened to you and now 
The next influence, of course, is your education. And then all the things that are happening with your global view. We didn't even talk about the global view, but we should. And addressing your um, question about the how, this is the shared belief idea that I've been talking about. Like, when you, you know, I've had meetings with people like, um, you know, like Crate and Barrel. Have you heard of them in the States? They're like a very good, so you talk to the buyer and you, sit, you show them this product and they go, nah, that's not us. And it's a young girl, she's sitting there, she's 20 something, and she knows that she has the shared belief of what Crate and Barrel stands for. Or even if I go to the two go buyer, you show them this, now, never sell that. They just say it like that. They know instantly what the shared belief of Tugo, what their brand identity is, and they know right away whether it's good or bad. Oh, some things when you bring in are so experimental, you don't know what to think, which is an interesting approach. Because, but if you're going to go in with something very experimental to Tugo, then you better have a lot of research and talk about everything, why it's going to be successful. They won't want to even understand your idea, concept, if it's new and innovative. They've never seen anything like it before. I have never seen anything like it before. So when you show me that idea, that's a complete expression of your generation and innovative and embraces the latest technology and environmental issues, sustainability, social, and like, what are you talking about? Well, then when you explain it to me, then yeah, maybe you have a chance of of getting your idea and by having <clears throat> but the share belief idea it's remarkable in different organizations and uh, companies how people can get once they become involved in it everybody knows what the idea is a bad company they don't know the idea a good company like Tugo they know the they know I mean they do a lot of training their share belief in terms of customer service when you walk in the door is unbelievable. Like the people are trained every morning, they have a session where they talk about the beliefs, right? What the company stands for. So that's what I mean. It's the repetitiveness, it's the training, and but also keywords. Like we started doing the keywords every meeting. I know it sounds kind of well. You put. Modern, affordable, <laughs> original. That's amazing. But now you know the keywords, but in the past, do you also have those keywords? Well, let me say that you have, to, there's intuition, intuitiveness. <coughs> intuitiveness is, you can't, you can't say that we are, we're not intuitive creatures. We do things very well intuitively. So, but you want to get there very quickly. You want everybody to be on the same page. You want to get them trained. You want to, this is your own training too. You want to do it efficiently. You want to do it uh, consistently. And you want to be able to do it um, very quickly because that's how we're more productive. I mean, this whole lecture is about being, giving yourself a chance to be more productive and to be more successful. Because you're going to develop your own methodologies too. If you don't, if you don't develop your own methodologies, you might be imitating this, which is not original. So you need to be able to freely flow. I love. I think your brains are in a good place right now too. There's a certain kind of energy in a young brain, which is marvelous. You can just flow ideas. Like my son is uh, you know, a musician, and he's working in. Uh, he's always working out. He's he's doing like um, composing, and like he's just like composing. I said, like, "What?" And he'll come down and, like he doesn't. Even, he's all self-taught too, like myself. By the way, I brought my harmonicas if you want to hear some harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, he could just flow it. I think, "What?" Well, like I I can't. I I'm stuck. Like I. So, so you're in a great shape right now, but you have to let yourself flow a little bit and then, but it's not all just random intuitiveness, it's a lot of research, that's the thing. And then how do you integrate your idea? You need to get support. 
Like you're going to go to an investor, let's say, with this new brand idea, right? Well, how are you going to convince an investor to come in if you're just intuitive? Well, I got this feeling. Please give me money. <laughs> but also, it's not just about, don't think that this is so business oriented that you're going to make a pitch that's totally about business. Because the business guy knows his business, right? So you're not going to tell him about his business, but you're going to tell him what he doesn't know about his business, about the creative aspects of it. That's where you're going to be the trusted advisor. Say, look, I really study your business. I went to the store and I studied the, I studied your customers, you know, and I saw, and I actually talked to your customers and they kept saying the same thing over to me over and over again about what you were missing in the store. Oh my God, that guy's eyes will be like this. What? So that's not intuitiveness, that's research. So the research is going to inform your thinking too, which is interesting. Yes, go ahead. Sorry to keep you waiting. Now, um, I will suggest that a, a good way to start uh, defining what you're about and like starting that, uh, getting to know your style and your, um, exactly. Uh, a good way to do that, it might be to define what you're not about. It, it might be like turning something negative in, in, in a positive way. Like as you say, um, you used to see how your parents used to live and uh, you just hate it. So at least now you have a clear picture of what you ah. want to be or where. Maybe that was it, yeah. Where, uh, or where, where you don't want to uh, go. We're having that kind of situation um, in the company that I work. Uh, we're defining different kind of brands, and particularly we we create a mood board for a project, for a specific project, and we were kind of lost starting this uh, line of products. Mm -hmm. So um, our team we we uh, sat down together and we start. Let's do a mood board, something that gave us a picture of the kind of product that we should have. And in the same uh, moment, the company, is, the company is doing this uh, brand architecture and we're defining different brands within the company. And we ended up having this mood board for a product that it turns out to be a mood board that kind of like reflect the brand or not, not the brand, but the, the products that are connected with the, uh, with the brand architecture. So it's been really hard for people to get there and a good way to do that was like, okay, so we have completely different brands and this is what we think this brand is. And to make it clear, this is what we think this brand it is not. So it's kind of a good way to have like the black and white. I like that. So what are we not? So then we can figure out who we are. Maybe that's, I said, you're saying my parents, I, I am not that, so what am I? <laughs> yeah, so that's a very good point. I like that. The, the, the same professor that, talk, that did the, the cards also um, suggested that we do, now this sounds negative, but she said, okay, create a sheet, divide it in half, and then this, the top column is, this is how I will fail. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, then you go down all the things you could possibly, and it's quite negative, you've got to be very negative. All the things that are going to be a roadblock to success. Every th possible thing that could hurt my idea. And then, on the other column, you start to develop, oh, the idea the mitiga to mitigate. Oh, in Spanish. Mitigate. 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 And then, so it's an interesting, both, both ideas are similar, to look at the very negative side, what you're not, and then what you are. So I think it's, um, it's a good methodology. It's hard to do the, nobody wants to look at all the stuff you're going to fail at. They just, they don't like the idea of all the failure. Oh my God, I'm going to fail. But that's a very good idea to use that methodology. So I think the fail one is good. 
Oh my God, it's tough though, because you're gonna really do some soul searching about all the things. I, I think this is a very a, a great, um, very productive lecture. You know, for me to say these things is not about a lecture too, but I'm also talking to myself about how I'm going to be improving. You know, or my all the things that I'm doing in my personal life, how I'm going to develop, how I'm going to work with people like yourself in the office. So actually doing things alone is something that will actually help inform your thinking. You have to put yourself out there. And I think you are, you are have taken a lot of risks by going to design school. It's a very ambiguous idea what's going to come out at the end. Well, maybe we should work on that exercise. At the end of all the education, where, where am I going to be? Or what's the, yeah, what's the fail list? <laughs> How am I going to mitigate that? We haven't talked about the, we tend to, we haven't talked about the global idea. I think the global idea is very important because everybody has the same problem worldwide. You're sitting at your desk. So you have this kind of vision when you're working on a project. It's pretty near, like a horse, you know, they call them blinders. <laughs> you're looking at it like this. But meanwhile, we've got the whole world that's going to be very important to us. Because today, if you only have a regional idea, it's very, very difficult to be successful. Most companies today will say that the regional only idea is not even a good enough idea to even get started. It has to be more global in its outlook. So I think we as designers have to be thinking about what are the, the idea of my brand, how do I convey that globally? It's not just a regional idea, but it's a global idea. How do I, how do I relate to the rest of the world on this, right? So that's a whole other area of topic, but I think See, Umber wouldn't be the company it is today if we were only regional. Now, some people say, okay, this is what they used to say to us, because I'm from Canada. Canada is a huge country, but it only has 35 million people. How many people in Colombia? Yeah, some more, right? So, small country. So when we first did the first product, like the window shade, so I took it to one, two stores in Toronto, and then there's Vancouver, then there's Calgary, then there's Montreal. Uh-oh, no other cities. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to start thinking about exporting the idea to the U.S. So all of a sudden, now I'm not just a regional manufacturer anymore. I'm an exporter. Oh, that changes things. I got to understand what American tastes are. I have to understand how they buy things. I have to understand the American market in terms of the competitiveness. I have to understand what the, the correct pricing is supposed to be. I have to understand the logistics of moving the idea across the border. This changes your whole way of thinking, right? Then you start thinking, oh, well, if I can sell to the US, why don't we try selling to other countries that are interested in it? So we get an inquiry from Japan. Oh, Japan's a long way away. But yeah, let's try going there with it. We show them the product and then, hmm. One of the first products we showed them was a mirror and we did a wall mirror. It was quite nice, very simple with a nice little graphic. As I said, you know, I'm a graphic designer so it's not fancy like Karim Rashid's, you know, curvy Garbino can. Mine was just like, <laughs> like, so I take it to Japan they say, oh, we really like this. But then they turned, they flipped it over, and they looked at the back and said, no, we, we don't like the back. I said, well, what do you mean you don't like the back? The back's not showing. It's against the wall. I said, no, no. When the Japanese see the back, if it's not nice, they're not going to buy it. I said, what? So we improved the back. <laughs> so we improved the front and the back, and we improved the whole idea. So that kept raising the bar on quality, right? The quality bar. So if you're selling to reach, look at the, okay, look at the U.S. manufacturers of cars. So in the 60s, 70s, 80s, oh man, they are doing so well. They've got 
250 million people to sell to. They're all got money. They're making cars, you know, big and doesn't care about the gas, whatever. Quality, yeah, not so great, but it doesn't matter. Everybody's buying the cars, right? Then all of a sudden, oh, Germany starts exporting to the US. Japan, UK, Britain, France, every other car company says, again, the quality's better. So all of a sudden, the Americans say, hmm, why should I buy an American? I can buy an even cheaper, a better quality Japanese car. Wow. They, the, almost the whole industry almost collapsed. Why? Because they were thinking just about their regional market. And they thought they had it all, but they didn't think globally about their competitiveness. So the lesson is, the lesson is that when people come to me in Canada, like designers, interior designers, other types of um, creative professionals, oh, what are we going to do about the U.S.? They're coming in here. They're, they're beating us up on this. They're beating us up on that. They're, they're very concerned about being, we're from Canada. We're small. And I say being from Canada is small is one of the reasons for our success because we had to think more globally about our idea. <laughs> because it was too small for just a niche product. And many of you will have very niche products that are going to be quite small for a regional market. But for globally, yeah, quite sustainable, right? So we need to be thinking. So Colombians could come to me all the time and say, oh, Colombia is too small to be able to. No, I don't buy it. I think, yeah, great place. <clears throat> My whole idea about being here and sharing it with you is that I really believe in the country and I think with the way things are with social, environmental, technical, you can be a great design center. Why, what's stopping you? It has nothing to do with the regional idea anymore. It should be a global idea. So what? To be a global player, you got to understand more than just your regional market. You got to start doing more global research, right? You got to understand how people are living all over the world. You have to understand um, your competitors around the world. This is, and it's all available, by the way, online. You don't have to fly everywhere, although it's good to travel. Travel is great for informing your thinking. If I was in the government of Colombia, I would fly all of you all over the world free. Wonderful. Yeah. Part of your education, let's say when you're, about to, when you're finishing high school, is you have to go work somewhere else in the world to get a feeling for what it's like <coughs> in the rest of the world. That would be, and it would be free. And then when you came back to Colombia, where you love your country, and you love to live, you would have a completely different way of thinking about the world. It would be global. So we, we, need, to, we need to talk about global a lot, but it, it's not going to happen unless... Um, unless you do the research. It's going to take some work. The regional idea is easy. You're sitting at your desk. This is regional, right? Right, so, you know, the designers in number two are, can be regional. They, we continuously have to remind them about global. And some of you might say, oh, global, global's the cause of all our problems, globalization. Well, that's another argument. But regional thinking that's supposed to work globally will never work. You have to be thinking globally. I, I love, don't get me wrong, I love regional. I love, I was in a farm on the weekend. That's regional. I was eating like regional food, right? What could be better than having something that's so local, right? I don't want garlic from China. So. So I, I believe in regional, and, and, and I also believe in um, this whole craft idea, too. But I think to be competitive, you have to understand what, it's, what the world is like globally. So we have to do our research, and it's very quite accessible. Like all those companies we research in Scandinavia or anywhere in the world, they're quite accessible. And we even knew all the customers they're selling to because it's on their websites. Like, and most people will tell you, 
like your research students or whatever, you go to the store, you go to Tugo, and there's a clerk there in front of the umber display, and you ask him, what's the best seller here? They'll, <laughs> they'll go and show you. And then you'll know everything about Tugo's business and Umbra, right? It's not that hard. You just have to get out there and do it. Do the research, keep researching, asking. But you're not going to do it unless you're driven with some kind of passion to do it. Like, what do you want to do anyways, and where do you want to go? You're going to have to figure that out first. And then you will, oh, I know my passion. I, you know, when I'm doing coaching with people, we always, there's one of the lessons we do is that, you know, you close your eyes and you say, like, what was the thing that I really liked doing in the last week the most? That I really, really liked. That's a good way to start coaching. And then you start, oh, because you asked about, like, which way you want to, like, maybe that's the way of doing it, is you figure out what really, really, really turned you on. Okay, but you have to kind of focus on that and then maybe you can discover yourself and then figure out what your passion is. Because I got to say anything you do here, you're not going to do the hard work and all, everything else without the passion, right? She's trying to think about what she did. The... Everybody's got a different idea. Mine was dinner last night. It was unbelievably amazing. I had dinner with Julia. <laughs> it was the most amazing food. I'm into food these days. The name? No. What was it? Casa Molina. Casa Molina, yeah. It was awesome. Okay, more questions? Okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little harmonica for you. So the, the reason I play harmonica, these are different harmonicas, right? So there's different keys too. So it's not just one harmonica that fits all. You have to have a certain harmonica. So this is like a C, C harmonica. So um, people ask me about, who's the musician here? Any musicians? Aha. So, but do you play in a band or alone? Solo. Both? Yeah. So, you know, remember when I talked about uh, the, you know, working in isolation as an artist where you don't have an opportunity to collaborate, right? It can be a real problem for a lot of artists because they, you throw them out into the world and all of a sudden they're in an office. Like, how do they collaborate? So, when you're when in a band, in a music band, it's not design and music, it's not just about being creative, it's about collaboration between musicians. So you have, see my idea of a great company would be analogous with a great jazz band because you have all these different musicians, let's say an improvisational jazz band. So everybody's doing their own creative thing individually, at the same time, the ensemble, everybody hears everybody else. They're all playing to a certain rhythm. They understand each other, right? That's a great company or a great team, right? Individual creative efforts. So when you guys assemble your creative team, it should be like a jazz band. I mean, they don't have to play music, but they have to be individually creative and <laughs> and also be able to listen. That's the thing with a, with a jazz band. So this is harmonica, right? You guys want to hear this? Yes. <laughs> Usually after I play harmonica, most people, I say, how was the lecture? So I really like the lecture, but I, I like your harmonica be playing better. <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, and I spent all that time talking, and all you wanted to hear was the harmonica. <laughs> okay, so. That's how it works, okay? Yeah, clap. <laughs> 
They didn't, they didn't clap like that after the lecture, but after the harmonica, <laughs> I get a lot of claps. More likes on harmonica. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. You're welcome. We enjoy it a lot. We, I think we, are, we all are very happy to have you here, and we are glad to see you. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about how we're going to collaborate in the future. And maybe we'll come up with some good ideas. I think one of the ways we, we, that was successful with our collaboration was we, um, we have a blog. So this is why I think you know, being, making, uh, making Medellin a design center is quite easy, because you can communicate globally just on your computer, right? So we have a blog at Umbra. And then you enroll with us so it's private. And we share ideas. You send ideas. I I'm, I'm comment when I see the ideas. You can have a continuous exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we try to work on an idea that we can, that we can ultimately commercialize. That's the idea. So thank you very much. <laughs>